Uh, excellent. Okay, we're recording. Uh, got it. Okay, perfect. So, oh yeah, it's time for us to start too. Welcome today to our lecture. What is this? Lecture four now? The semester's going by really quick already. So um, before I pick up where we last left off, um, does anyone have any questions about what we covered previously? I actually went back this has been a really good opportunity because I've taught this class a lot of times and for the longest time, I just didn't believe in PowerPoint because I thought that PowerPoint was the lazy approach to deliver a lecture that you can get into really bad habits with PowerPoint delivery where you just have a PowerPoint and then I narrate what you already see on the slides. And so before I guess uh, COVID had happened, I really, I really liked having a give and take in the classroom and using the whiteboard to its full extent and ha have engaged in a dialogue. But that's super difficult to do. Tried a couple of times now. I've had a couple of opportunities to try that approach with the, with the online model it just doesn't work. So I'm slowly taking all my handwritten notes and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm putting them into my own PowerPoint presentation so that I can deliver the content to both the uh, online students, but also to the in-person students. But you guys are teaching me a lot. So I'm gonna go over some of the slides we went over last class that I've decided to add to it. And hopefully in the near future, I'll have a complete set of slides that I can just give to everyone else that I think encapsulates all of the critical uh, information that will rapidly get you to the point where you can be confident in software development. So with that said, we talked a little bit about data models in our prior era lectures, and we started talking about algorithms. And I'm assuming in labs, you're already starting to work on very basic algorithms, probably input, output, and some type of processing operation, like probably arithmetic, operations or relational operations or equality operations. Um, and so I wanna talk more, I wanna to get to that part. That's part of this PowerPoint slide, but I wanna make sure that everyone has a strong foundation. This isn't a race, this is a marathon. So it's, it will behoove us to make sure your foundation is strong here so that when we get deeper into the semester, you don't have holes in your knowledge where it can easily trip you up. So I'm gonna to try to walk through a little slower this semester than I typically go. And I already feel like I do a really good job of setting a foundation, but I think I see where there are definitely places where we could have some improvements. I'm hoping this is gonna be the best semester yet. So what I might do though is close this door. And anyone who's late will have to knock. And uh, my, I have my computer all cleared up so I can actually operate. So my goal is to get all the slides, uh, all the slides and the, uh, the videos up later today. I had a big research deadline today. So that absorbed my time immediately after I was done with this, my slides. I had no idea if it was gonna take four full days, like 40 hours to get through 918 tabs. Uh, it's too many, too much stuff was open on my computer at once. Okay. so. Algorithm building blocks. Let's just go quickly look over what we already talked about and look at the new stuff. Ah, so here's a new slide that I added. So I'll just go ahead and mention some of the content of what I added. So before I, I, I ran, so we had a data modeling slide where we talked about recipes and we talked about being able to take phenomena or observations and map them in a way that we can either uh, quantify them. We first and foremost try to quantify a piece of data. If we can't quantify it, then we qualify it, right? And everyone, we talked about the difference between quantification and quali uh, the qualitative data and uh, quantized data, right? And so here, let me do this. I'm gonna. So here, if I go ahead and um, look at one of the fundamental types of data, I feel like I should have mentioned this before jumping right into algorithm. I mentioned where we want to quantify things, but then I don't tell you what are our basic building blocks that we use to build every data model that we then build algorithms on top of. 
And so it's important to understand that the data modeling step comes before the algorithm step. And I'll highlight that. Like before you start either reading recipes or you start um, or you start writing food recipes, you have to understand how to quantify heat, right? You have to know how to quantify time and you have to know how to quantify your ingredients. If you go and read a recipe and you don't know what cups are, you don't know what hours are, and if you don't know what degrees are, you're not going to be able to follow the step-by-step -step instructions. So fundamentally, it doesn't make sense to talk about algorithms until you learn the data model. So this is the other thing, though. So all our data models in Java, or just so happens in any programming language, it just so happens this is true for any domain where we try to quantify things. So this is universally true. Can be modeled as one of three types of data, as either numerical data, as either text data, or as, as either Boolean data. So those are our three very foundational primitive data types. At the end of the day, that's how we can describe things. Regardless of what it is, we can attach meaning in those three representations. Those are going to be our building blocks for all of our data models. Now, numerical data can take one of two forms. You have a form that is exact, and there is a form that is approximate. And so numerical data is what we call quantitative data. If it has a number, then we've, then we've been able to quantify it. If we can't represent it as a number, then it's qualitative data or categorical data. So integers are exact, right? When I say the number one, one only means one thing. And then the next thing inside of the integer data set is the number two, and then the number three, right? They're very exact. Floats are always approximations. And this isn't a computational thing. This isn't because computers only have a certain amount of memory to track how many precision points they are. By definition, floats represent, well, an approximation. I don't know how else to describe it. It's, but it's not exact. So one of the problems that you'll incur, let, let me highlight the difference between approximate and exact. What, why should you care? At the end of the day, that's what we should talk about. Why should you care between these two things? You can check on equality for things that are exact, right? This is equal to that. For approximations, you can't look at equality exactly. You have to define what equality is based off of the number of uh, precision point errors, right? So you give yourself some delta range that you say, you say if it's within this scope, then that's close enough to be considered equal, right? And so again, we go back to the idea that mathematically, in order to be able to get our integers map to our floats, we have to rely on the fact that the integer one is equal to the floating point value of 0 0.9999 infinitely repeated, because that's an approximation. So, it, so we have to, in order to map our arithmetic operators, understand that that's a true thing. But it can trip you up, because you might have a floating point number that you have inside of your code, and you might want to check it for equality. And, it, and what you put into the system or what the system gives back to you might be two different values. And that's normal. Like that's a normal behavior of something that is an approximation. So keep that in mind whenever you use a floating point value. That is a thing. Okay. And then text, we call strings in Java. But when you hear strings, just think of text. And Boolean is just anything that's true or false or yes or and no. Okay. So fun, fun, found, uh, fundamentally, these are always our building blocks whenever we try to do any kind of modeling. This is our quantitative versus our qualitative. So our algorithms are ordered set of instructions that rely on these data models, but all human knowledge can be represented using these basic units of data. That's the entire goal of what we use for scientific analysis. And you do the scientific analysis in every hard science and soft science and business science and management science or education science, it, it's all about taking your observations and phenomena and mapping it into one of these, these units of data. So when you learn how to master this, you become a very effective 
a, a different type of effective communicator than you were before. Because you can't, you won't just rely on uh, natural language to communicate ideas, but you can start to rely more on a quantitative or a mathematical definition for things. Excellent. Is there any uh, questions? Did this slide help? Was the inclusion of the slide? Okay. So, uh, fundamental types and data in Java. So, rules for primitive types. Primitive types in Java mean that the values do, do not need to be stored in memory. So, when I say that Java has a primitive type, it means that every possible value for that particular data type is already known inside of the JDI. It doesn't have to hold the space in memory. It can look it up. So it's very fast. It's very fast lookup for values that are friendly. So all primitive data types in Java use the lowercase keyword. So we know as developers if a data type is primitive or not based off of whether it has a lowercase name. So any type that is not primitive is a reference type. What that means is that the values of the data type and when I say values, what does values mean to you? Like numbers or strings. Yeah, so so exactly. So if I say, give me a value from the integer data set, what might you say? Uh, number, a whole number. Like the number three is a value. It's an exact unit that is defined within the data set. So number four would be a value in integer. 3.4 would be a value from the floating point data set. Right, true would be a value of the Boolean data set. Right, so when I say value, I'm talking about a member to the whole of the type. So again, primitive data types, Java by default knows every single member without having to look it up. Anything that's a reference data type, the reason why it's called a reference data type is it doesn't know it intuitively, it has to store that value inside of memory. And every time it needs to access it, it has to do a memory lookup. So understand that's more costly than something that's internally built into the system. And you can kind of get that intuitively, right? So we'll talk more about that when we start talking about reference data types, but I'm trying to see some of these concepts. Let's talk about the fundamental types of uh, data in top. So like I said, there are three primitive units of data that exist not just in, in Java, not just in programming languages, but in the way that we describe things using mathematical models, right? Numbers, text, and booleans. And so numbers I can subdivide into integers or floating points or fractional values. So then we have our text, which can be, uh, well, just text. And then we have our Boolean value, which Let's see, this thing's kind of blocking me slightly. Maybe I can do this. Okay, put it up here for now. Okay. Or what I can do is maybe I can do this. I can, perfect. That's what I need to do all this time. Just move this so it doesn't block the view. Okay, so. I create this chart that maps from the most abstract concept of what we're talking about to the more concrete example. So when we say, hey, Java supports numbers, well, the first thing we have to do is we have to, we have to split our concept of numbers between those that are exact, which is our integers, versus those that are approximations, which are floating point numbers. So let's look at the integers first. There's four different types of exact numbers that we have access to in Java. The most popular one I highlight in yellow. So the yellow one here is int. Typically, that's what you'll see the most to represent an integer number. But you also have access to a byte, a short, and a long. So here, I want to highlight all the second uh, column here represents our primitive or reference type. So everything I want to show you here is the fundamental type. So they're all going to be primitive except for this shrimp. There's one reference type that I put on here and there's no getting away from it. There's no way to represent, as much as we would love to represent text as a primitive data type, it's just impossible. You, because you can't store 
every permutation of letters into a into a JVM, into into a pre-built system. So, right, like because because the number of permutations that we can do with letters is is infinite, right? Like, does everyone see that? Like, we can never get past this letter A because every time I would ask you, is that all the amount of letter A's we can have, you can always just add another one to the end of it, right? And that's a valid, that would be a valid piece of text, right? Like A, valid piece of text. A, A, valid piece of text. A, 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 valid piece of text. A, 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 valid piece of text. At no point can I ever stop, because if I say, can I stop now? You're like, no, I want to add another A. Completely valid. So there's no scoping. See, with numbers, we can scope them. We could say we're going to have a minimal number and a maximum number. But even though we can, uh, we can, we can apply a number ring to our letters. We can say, oh, it's an alphanumerical order. There's no true ordering in terms of how we can store them. So that, unfortunately, is going to be the one reference type we have to deal with initially. Okay. So what's this third column here? Well, this is to give you a clue of how much space in memory each of these data type types take and consume. So uh, you'll learn much more about this when you go into assembly, but understand that again, computers are not intelligent. I can't even call them stupid because in order to be stupid, you need to have intelligence. Computers are non-thinking entities. Right. And so the idea of being able to know information, that is a human characteristic. The ability to understand what it means to have these three different data types, true, false, or text, or numbers, right? Like computers don't know what any of that stuff is. So how do you think a computer can track it? How do you think a computer tells the difference between an integer and a piece of text and a, a floating point number? We have to encode it. It's all encoded. And so what do you think the basis of encoding in the computer system is? So a computer doesn't know. It doesn't, it's not really aware of what it's processing. All it knows is that it has a register of values that are represented as binary units. And so a binary unit is something, it's one of the few things that a machine can discriminate against because it can be represented as an on-off switch. So a machine understands if a particular state is on or off. And so what that allows us to do as computer scientists is identify or, or define a base two numbering system. So a base two numbering system, is everyone familiar with numbering systems on multiple bases? Like where you can have a big, so right now, the base you probably are most familiar with is the decimal base number, right? You go from zero to nine, and then you start a pattern of re repeat. But there's other number systems that exist. Like there's a base 12 system that a lot of human society used before the base 10 system became very popular. Uh, there's the base eight system, which is really popular in computer science. Base 16 is supremely uh, useful. Base two is foundationally important. So base two is the numbering system by which we encode all of our knowledge into computers. And again, it's because of the concept that each individual binary unit, which if I concatenate those terms together, I call that bit. A bit stands for one singular binary unit to be represented like as a light switch that's either in an on or off position. So I can, I can encode concepts to that, like I can use those as the words in a computer language. So, for instance, if I had one bit, how many states can I define to that? Two with one bit, right? I can have the definition for when it's on and definition for when it's off, right? If I have two bits, how many states can I go ahead and define to? Right, yeah, four, because I can define. Uh, one for zero, zero, one for zero, one, one for one, zero, and another for one, one, right? So pretty much the way that you can understand the number of definable terms 
on a binary sequence is if you took the number two and you put it to the square of uh, the, the power of however many binary units you have, right? So if you had one bit, two to the power of one is two different options. If you had two bits, two to the power of two is four. If I had three bits, two to the power of three is eight, right? So that's eight different. And if you did it by hand, if you encoded it zero, 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 one, zero, one, one, yeah, and it just did you if you if you walked it all the way through, you'll see those eight unique combinations of just zeros and ones. So at the end of the day, every piece of data that we're encoding in the machine is the same set of encodings, but we give it a context that so 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 like the integer number that we have and the floating point number is just a combination of zeros and ones. The only way that the computer knows whether it should be a floating point or whether it should be an integer is because we tell it which way it's supposed to parse that binary sequence. That's why it's important to define a data type. Does that make sense? So when we start defining our storage operations, we have to define, hey, this is going to be an integer data type. And then the JDM knows, oh, so when I see this binary sequence, I know to parse it using the encodings for integers and not the encodings for floating point numbers. Because to the computer, it all looks the same. It's just a sequence of on and off switches or on and off states more accurately. It's not really switches. That's, that, that's a switch. Inside of a computer, it's a state. Does that, does that much make sense? And it's a, it's a sequence of ordered states that it uses to encode information. And then we use software to decode that information into whether it's going to be a floating point value or whether it's going to be an integer or whether it's going to be a Boolean value. So we do all the work of actually translating and giving context to what that binary word is. Again, you'll learn much more about that in assembly. But this is just giving you a taste of how data is fundamentally stored inside of our systems. Okay, so this gives you an idea of how much space these consume. Typically, in a computer system, the smallest amount of addressable space is a byte. So the individual bits don't have their own addresses. A byte does. So a byte is a group or a sequence of eight bits. So eight bits makes a byte. And so how many, how many possibilities do you have for that? What's two to the power of eight? No. 256. Right? But but okay, so so but let's see how this let's let's see how this starts to process out. So notice you can start seeing which of these parameter types are smaller versus larger. Would you believe that there's a data type called bytes? And guess what the size of it is? It's a byte, yeah, or eight bits. So one of these represents a byte. Is what you're seeing here, or the min max value of a byte, it's an integer, it can be represented as an integer value, is negative 128 to positive 127. Zero counts towards the positive end, so the negative end always goes one more than the positive end. Zero is a non negative value. Zero. Okay. So a short is twice as large as a byte, it's two bytes. But look at how much we gain in terms of impossible encoding values. We jump from minus 128 to 127 to minus 32,768 to 32,767. Now, typically, this is still not enough numbers for most applications. The reason why we use integers is look, this is four bytes, that's 32 bits, and it gives us what is this, minus 2 billion? to positive 2 billion. For most applications, integers are enough. But in these rare instances, you might, have, you might need something larger than an integer, right? Like, let's say that you're counting the number of atoms in the universe. Then that's not going to be big enough. Or let's say that you need to count for the number of people on the planet. That might not be enough either, right? So if you do need a larger value than this, then you can actually use a long. A long is twice as big as an int. That's eight bytes. And I don't even know how to pronounce that number. 
It's just a really big number. A number that's probably bigger than you'll ever need. Okay, let's look at the fractional numbers. So we can define our fractional numbers by float and double. Now, like I said before, where with our integers, those are exact, so we can give one unit per integer, right? So that, that gives us like the difference between like uh, 2 billion to 2 billion, negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. But for, for numbers, what we get from the storage space is an amount of precision points. So it's going backwards, not, not forwards. So with floats, you only get six to seven precision points of accuracy. With double, which stands for double precision, double precision as compared to float, because it's eight bytes instead of four bytes, you get 15 to 16 decimal points. So in your applications, you always want your approximation to be as close as what it's supposed to represent as possible. So you should always use a double data type as opposed to a float. Almost never use float. Pretend like floats don't exist. Okay. For strings, there's two types of strings. Strings are reference size. We talked about why. But look, I actually can consume memory on a string. Four bytes. What, what do you think that is? What do you think the memory consumed for a string is? Yeah, it's a hexadecimal address. Yep. So the value is the address in memory. So the string can actually be really large. The string could take up uh, several addressable bytes uh, in, 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 uh, inside the computer system, but the address to access where the string resides in memory is always going to be the same. It's always going to be a four byte hexadecimal address, regardless of how big the actual string is. So, again, another way you might want to think about that, I like to tap into analogies a lot, is think about houses. You can have a small house. And you can have a very large house, but their addresses are about the same size, right? If you mail them a letter, you can't, you don't know if the house you're going to mail a letter to is like a little hovel or if it's going to be like a city block mansion. Okay, characters or cars are these really weird things. They represent a singular character which is kind of like text, but that character inside the system is encoded with an ANSI code, so it actually also represents a number. So the way we can translate between our text to numbers is with the car. So the car is a primitive data type, and it takes the form. It has a dual form of both a singular letter and a number. And again, that's only going to be two bytes because it only has to encode all of the characters on your keyboard. And finally, Boolean is one bit. It's only one bit because how many states does a Boolean have? Two. True or false. But now this is this is one of the interesting things. Didn't I claim that the smallest amount of addressable space is a byte? How can we actually have a data step, uh, type that only consumes a bit? How is that possible? What do you think the intuition is? What do you think the answer is there? Because Boolean represents on and off. It does. But normally, if I want to save that in memory, I can't have a space any smaller than a byte, right? That's even if all I want is a bit, usually the smallest allowable space I have access to is a byte. But the reason why Boolean is allowed to be a single bit inside of Java is because it's a primitive data type. So they are able to have access to the one byte and actually allocate it for other things. So they might have defined a particular bit inside of a byte addressable string, uh, 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 space and have access to that. So it, it's an optimization thing. Just to understand, highly optimized is not actually taking any computer memory, it's actually inside of the JVM. So it can reserve that space however it wants and it allocate its own addressable space on top of that. But normally, you can only have something that is a byte. So I just want to highlight that if you look this up, it's actually a bit, but it's because it's a private data type. You cannot do that with a reference data type. You even, 
Okay, is there any questions? Does this all make sense? Does, does, the, does examining these data types in particular like this help? Okay, question. Um, why do bytes um, and shorts even really exist if you're using ints? Well, that's a good question. Um, so, way back when Java was first created, we didn't have the wealth of memory that we have now. And in fact, that's still the case in embedded systems. So where it might not make sense when you're on like a laptop or you're, you're on a server and you have like unlimited amount of storage resources, that's not always the case in a system where you're building software that lives on a chip itself. And so for optimization reasons, if you don't need something that goes from minus 2 billion to positive 2 billion, and if you actually have a limited amount of memory foot space, then it behooves you to use a short if your numbers ever are going to just be between like 1 and 10, for instance. So it allows for you to be able to highly optimize your code to minimize your memory footprint. So that's first and foremost. Instead of just giving you one blanket data type, they give you options to select so that you can make a analysis of what is best for your own purpose. Now that's true for short, that's true for ant, and that's true for long too. Longs are there in case you need a number that's bigger. Shorts are there in case you don't want to use all the memory that four bytes, I mean, it's really silly, right? Like four bytes doesn't sound like that much. But I guess in some very limited, like high embedded systems, that does make a difference. Um, then bytes. Bytes actually are super critical. And you'll actually be using bytes as a data type in the next class. And so remember, we use the metaphor of the way we import data into our application. And we export data out of our application using the concept of streams, right? Like we think of it like we have a river stream that flows in the app. And like something on the outside throws things into the river and we pick it up on our side, right? And then when we want to send stuff out of our app, we throw things into the river. Well, what do you think we're throwing into our stream? Bytes. The fundamental unit that we encode things is bytes. So when we're actually importing applications and exporting applications, we're doing it at a, a, a data, we're doing it at a byte level. So this is the data type that Java has to depend on because this is the fundamental unit that we encode things in. So that's why this exists. That's why a byte exists. And you'll actually use things like byte arrays to be able to access the input and output stream and be able to read back things like uh, data, actually, and pull it not as text, but as, as like a represented piece of data from another application. So as actual objects, like floats, or even more complex objects that contain multiple pieces of data. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay. Um, okay, I think that covers that, that slide. Let me go back over here. Let me see, I probably can't see me, okay. Okay, is there any questions about this? So usually this isn't something we really go this in depth on, but I think that there's a value here to be able to map a uh, firm understanding. How many bits are in one byte again? There are eight bits to one byte, and a byte is the smallest addressable space. Oh. So a bit represents a singular binary unit, but we usually group those units in a cluster of eight, and that's the what we create a binary word in. So if we want to think of having a computer language, the characters in that language are the zeros and ones. But we group them in the form of eight. So if we group them in the form of a, a sequence of eight, we can represent those as two hexadecimal values. That's why if you look at a lot of uh, binary code, it's actually using letters in there as well, because a hexadecimal representation rotates after 16 unique characters to so that zero through 15. So that's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then A, B, C, D, E, F. And so the F represents 15, right? You know, the A represents 10, the B represents 11, the C represents 12, 
the D represent me at either. So go all the way until you get to L. Again, that'll have more meaning to you when you go and uh, into assembly. So this will all be information that you use in some later information. It's just background information right now. Like you won't, things that I'm giving you aren't gonna help with building software, except that it's gonna give you a really firm understanding about what you're building on top of. Okay, so there's this concept of literal values too. I want everyone to be super aware of what a literal value is. A literal value is just a very well-defined value that's inside of a data type. So like if I say, give me a literal value of the integer data type, you can tell me the value of three, right? In Java, that is an example of a literal, literal value. A literal value of a long would be, it could be a very big number. It doesn't have to be a very big number though. It could be the number three too as well. But the way we distinguish between its and longs in Java is that we have to supply some other symbol so it knows to parse it as a long as opposed to an integer. So we usually put an L as part of the number. And so then Java knows if an L is attached at the end of the number, that that's a long data type and not just an integer. The integer is the default value. For a floating point, if you want to use a float, which I highly suggest you don't, you should just drop it from your memory that it exists. There's, whereas ints are four bytes, right? And longs are eight bytes, and we preference the smaller integer versus the long, we always preference the double versus the float. Because the only gain you get from using a long is if you need bigger numbers. But you always gain from using the double because it's a better approximation. Because it's 16 to 15 decimal points of uh, precision as opposed to five or six. So, if, so because of that, the default value of a double is just a numerical value that has a rate point. So if you want it to be a float, you actually have to put the F after the number. Okay, characters are usually identified with the apostrophe symbol. So a single, I usually call that single quotation. I guess this is kind of annoying moving around. Um, and then strings use double quotations. So remember, a character can only have one singular letter or character, whereas a string can be any number of characters. But of course, that's a reference data type. That's not technically a primitive data type. We treat it as such because it's a fundamental building block for building data models. But conceptually, in the computer science world, there's no way to actually sort it as a primitive data type. This is not a closed set of values. So that's the one thing all these other ones have in common is it's a closed set of values. Closed means that it's, uh, it's, it's well-defined that it is, uh, there's a set amount that's finite, right? Closed means that it's a finite set. We can't unfortunately define a finite set that represents strings. And then Boolean, well, that's just true or false, but keep in mind that true and false are in all lowercase. That's gonna be a common theme. Primitive uh, keywords in Java are typically always lowercase. The only ones that are uppercase are classes and interfaces, which is our type of class, effectively. So we've seen when we did our hello world, how we defined a class. Okay, note to self, move those to the data model section. Work in progress. <laughs> Okay, uh, and then I made this new slide. What is an algorithm? Now that we talked about data models, ways to measure things around us and model that in terms of quantitative and qualitative properties to make use of these models, we use algorithms, right? Models are just a way for us to measure things. But it's an important way because it's the first step we need before we can start even talking about algorithms. Like again, a great example of algorithms, one of my favorite are recipes. But a recipe doesn't make sense until you understand what the measures are defined inside the recipe. You've grown up with that, so that's something that's super easy. But if you've never encountered it before, then you'd have to learn what minutes are and what temperatures are and what cups are and what cups. 
So using RPC, yep, just talked about this. Using the recipe as an example, we talked about data models as it's a quantity of time. That's the thing. Whenever you're thinking about how we're defining things, it's measures. So it's a quantity of time, a quantity of heat, a quantity of ingredients. And if it's not a quantity, then it's going to be a qualitative data uh, categorization. Anyway, once we've established the definition for those things, we can start designing our recipe. So only after we know our data models can we start designing our recipe. And what is our recipe? Well, it's an ordered set of instructions. That's all it is. Okay. Uh, well, I think. Oh, I went up. Okay, let's see here. So, okay, and we already discussed this. So we said there's in, inside of now. This isn't true generally. You can build algorithms however you want on pen and paper. But when it involves a computer, there's five basic building blocks we have to become accustomed to in order to build our algorithms, to automate our algorithm uh, design. So we have the output operations, the storage operations, the input operations, the processing operations, control operations. We already talked about the output operations and the storage operations. And I'm hoping that talking about the data models as their models in Java will make the storage operations a little bit easier to understand now because I'm not just throwing things out. So for instance, I, oh, I don't know why I keep doing that. So for instance, I showed you the other day, this print app and made me realize I should talk more about the data types because I, I have some questions about print app, the format of print string and what all the different uh, placeholders are. And so it just so happens that all the placeholders we can put in a format of string and a print out statement correspond to all the, print, the data types that exist in Java. So it would include me Last class to show you what I showed you this class when I showed you print app. So, for instance, if I use percent s, that says, hey, I want to embed a string into my formatted string. So, the way that print app works is I have to have a formatted string here and then my formatted string. So, that's going to be the thing that's printed. But the thing that I print can have placeholder values. Placeholder values are these things which represent something that will be replaced with something else. And then if I want to have a placeholder value for each placeholder value that's in my format of string, I have to have a comma separated list inside of my parentheses here that gives a value for that. So for instance, if I had something like this, uh, like I could have a, a tax and then I could do percent s. So this would be one placeholder value inside this print app. So if I have at least one thing, it's got to be replaced with something. So then I would have to put a comma here and actually give back a data type of a string because it's a placeholder for a string. So I could put something like, oh, I don't know. Like, so I could do something like this, like world. And so what's going to happen is when this goes to print to the terminal, it's going to take this value and it's going to put it where that percent S is at. But I, I'm not just limited to strings. I, if I use C, I can do a character. If I do D, I can do decimal integers. If I do F, I can do floating point numbers. If I do B, I can do Boolean values. And so again, the real powerful thing about print F is I don't have to put a string literal here. I can put a variable there and I can mutate and change state over time so that the actual makeup of my string can be dynamic. It can be immutable. It can change what it's printing as the application runs. So printf is a very powerful uh, print statement inside of our tool, inside of our arsenal. But see, print, but see how printf goes a while on this concept of understanding our foundational and fundamental data types. So that might not have been super clear last time. That should be a percent sign there. Okay, so, and then here, don't need to talk about this anymore. This, because we already did that. So let me put delete. Put that in red. No, I'm just going to move on. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Okay, let's see what else we have. Uh, so uh, I think we got this far, right? Does that remember this slide from last class where we said, okay, for storage operations, there are three different types of storage operations, operations, assignments, and initializations. 
So storage operations are responsible for saving data to use for future steps. By default, any data that we process on a line is discarded. It, it, it's, it, it's not automatically remembered. So if we want to store data for future use, we have to put it in a variable. So in order to put in a variable, we have to, we have to uh, declare that variable. A, a variable declaration requires two pieces of, uh, it, it requires two things. The type of data that you want to store, because again, you got to tell the JDM what encoding is it going to use to translate the binary representation or whatever the actual context of the data is. And then the second is a name a reference, a label, an identifier. What are you going to call in your application? And that label should be meaningful. It shouldn't just be like the letter X. If you're trying to represent something that represents width in your application, use the word width, right? If it's height, use the word height. If it's number of students, then do student count or number of students. And so this is what's going to uh, enforce what's called um, uh, kind of self-documenting uh, code, so or readable code, or literate code. These are all terms for the same thing. So that just by reading the source code, you understand what your model, what the algorithm does. Okay, so declarations are where we store, where we declare that space in memory, and we bind a memory address to a label. Assignments is where we use the label to access that memory address, either to write into it or to read from it. Initialization is just a declaration and assignment all at once, where we declare and assign at the same time. And again, if we just look at the source code, this is a initialization, because on this site, Because if I cover this up here, I see int, that's my data type, right? And then any, this could be anything, but you should strive to make this as readable as possible. So integer number, then this would just be an assignment. Integer number is equal to 10. When it's combined, when it's both a declaration and an assignment, this is an initialization. So this is an initialization. This is an example of an assignment. This is an example of initialization, 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 and initialization. For some reason, I never showed a way for just a declaration, but if you wanted to say just a declaration, uh, that's what that would look like, where you can just go ahead and declare a variable, but not assign the value to it. And so one thing in Java is you can't, write or read from a variable until you've declared it. You have to declare it before you can use it. So let me ask you this. Why, when might you use declaration versus when might you use initialization? Why wouldn't you just initialize all your data? Sometimes you're going to have variables change over time. Yeah I, mean, yeah, I mean, sometimes you might not know what the initial state of the data is, right? Let's say, for instance, I want to compute a sum. And so how do we define sum? Mathematically, what is the definition of a sum? Wait, the average, I'm sorry. Let's say we wanted to, to take the average of something. So what's the definition of an average? Yeah, well, if you're going to divide by how many values you That's right, yeah. And you take the sum of whatever the values are, and you divide it by the count. So let's say that we can initialize the count and let's say we can initialize the sum but we can't necessarily initialize the average because that's the thing we're trying to solve so we might declare that we might initialize the other two values then we take the sum we divide it by the count and then we can assign that into the variable we declared earlier in our application so understand there are instances where you can know what the value is ahead of time but there's instances you know you're going to need it but you don't have it yet. That's when you declare it and not initials. Does that make much make sense?
Okay. Okay. Let's go into input operations. We, have, we certainly haven't talked about this. So input operations are very similar to output operations, but they work in the reverse direction. Our input operations are responsible for getting data into the program from the outside. Let's replace user because it doesn't have to be a user. It could be another application. So let's just put from outside, from the outside. Okay, so what is it or so uh, using the concept of stream, we can flow data into our app from the outside. Yeah. And we'll you'll learn much more about streams in the next course, but we'll just make use of system in and system out. Uh, so however, with input, the program does not uh, the program does not what the data is, does not know. Okay. I like pointing at slides, so I'm constantly oscillating here at the camera. Okay, so input is a little bit more challenging than output. And why do you think that is? What do you think the intuition is? Why do you think input would be a harder thing to handle than output? Because it's unpredictable based on what you use. Exactly. We have an unfair advantage with output because we're the ones who are sending the thing out, sending the data out. So we know how much data is going to be part of our cargo, part of the thing that we're shipping. But when we're, we're getting a shipment in, we don't have any control over what, what is getting passed to us, right? So there's kind of like a management task, there's kind of like an inventory task there, right? where we need to be able to read things off of the stream and decide whether we have all the information or not. And whether and where the cutting off point is and where we start to translate it into some kind of meaningful form of data. So because of that, there is a, it's a little bit more difficult to get access or to get data into our application than to just get it out. Now, Again, we have this system class that's given to us from the standard library. We saw previously there's the system.out, that's the output stream that we make use of that has the print statements that allows us to send our data out and then print it out to the terminal. Well, system also has an input stream, system.in. And we can use the system.input stream to get data into our application, but we can't use it by itself. System.in doesn't have methods like system.out does like print methods, system.in has to be used, it has to be wrapped around something like a scanner that can scan the input stream and the scanner has all the logic, it has all the knowledge on how to read data, how to read the bytes from the input stream and how to convert it into data that's meaningful to us, how to read it as text or how to read it as integers or how to read it as doubles or how to read it as booleans. And you probably already started seeing that in lab. So, for instance, for instance, imagine. So, how does it work? How do our input operations work? So, imagine if I'm typing away on my keyboard, right? And I want the system to load all the type keys as I press them in the order that I press them in, right? That is when I type things in, when I provide data in a stream. It's not just the data that I care about, but the ordering also matters, right? That's why we use the concept of strings, because it allows us to create an order of unit one of data, unit two, usually call those tokens. So the data that's inside of our stream is token one, token two, token three, token four. And then we can plug those tokens out, and then we can convert them into what we expect them to fit. But suppose that we're, we're trying to predict what scanners can do for us. So we're just typing letters on the keyboard, then we might represent our input stream as this, right? If I type in H, and H is going to go into the input stream, and then in E. So if I type hello world, and then that's the inner key, right? Then I hit enter. Then what's being loaded is a set of uh, characters, right? H E L L O space W O R L D new line character.
So if this is the state of my input stream, so if if I type this text, then what should be the first word? Like if I'm just looking at the input stream and I had to make this decision, when would I decide to stop? Would it be after just the H? Should it be when I hit the space? Should it be when I hit the enter key? I mean, now let me ask you this. Is it all of those valid? Maybe I do want to just have the singular character. Or maybe I want as my delimiter where there's a space and grab a single word at a time. Or perhaps I want to grab the entire piece of text all the way up to a new line character. So this is the logic that goes into determining how to pluck this information and decide how it's going to get read, how it's going to get parsed, how it's going to get packaged into the fundamental data type that we have in Java. And this is a, this can be a relatively challenging problem, but guess what? It's one we can ignore because the tools for parsing the data in an input stream is given to us. There's a class in java.util package called scanner, that the entire purpose of the scanner class is to read input streams and parse them into the data we need in our application. So yeah, we have the scanner object. The scanner object has a bucket or buffer, which holds multiple characters of data at once. And so the standard job is determining what constitutes the whole piece of data and translate that text into a, a data model that we want. I'm going to just stick around here so I have to stop moving the camera so much. So imagine we have this input stream one, two, three, four, five, space, six, seven, eight, nine, new line character. The first number is not necessarily one, right? We wouldn't just pluck that one, even though that's a valid number, you probably would wanna pluck the integer all the way until you hit the space. And in fact, that's what the scanner object uh, is gonna do. When you look for the next int, the delimiters are a space, a tab or new line character. So here, if we put new, uh, next int, it's gonna grab one, two, three, four, five, it'll grab, or more precisely, that's 12,345. And then the next number we could pull would be um, 6,789. And so we can even tell the scanner object to pull a next int. And if this, the system.in is empty, then the program, our application will pause and wait until tokens are inputted into the system.input stream. So do keep that in mind with the scanner object is that when you're running your application, sometimes it will wait for input. It'll wait until you insert something from the keyboard. And so here, has everyone seen an example of this in lab already? Is this, does this look familiar? So again, the way that, so, we don't, unlike the java.lang package, which is by default in automatically and implicitly imported into all of our software, we have to manually import the scanner class if we want to use it. We have to explicitly do an import. So here we would import from, from the Java standard library is a package called util, which has a lot of utility classes that we'll use throughout the entire semester. We'll get very familiar with java.util. The first one that we're gonna use from this package so is gonna be the scanner class. Once we import the scanner class, then we can start using it. Now the scanner class also like string represents a reference data type. It's something we, we have to store in memory and not something that is primitive in, in, in the system. So here, when we do our declaration, the data type for our scanner object is going to be scanner. Then we can give it a label or a reference so that we can use it through our application. I like to call my input, but you can call it whatever you want. 
right? That's just a reference. It could be keyboard. It could be, those are the two common ones that you should see, keyboard or input. But it could be literally anything you want it to do. This doesn't matter. This is super important. You have to use the data type though, because it's a very particular definite data type. Okay, so here I'm doing a declaration. Then I'm using an assignment operation. The assignment operation is a single equal sign. If you want to do equality, you use two equal signs. We'll talk about that later. But one of the biggest mistakes early developers use is confusing the assignment operator from the equality operator. In math, equality is defined as a single equal sign. In computer science, it's two equal signs. In computer science, the single equal sign is an assignment. It means the thing on the left-hand side, I mean, I mean, the thing on the right-hand side is getting moved into the thing on the left-hand side. So what that means is an assignment operation, the thing on the left-hand side always has to be a variable that's linked to some memory address. And the thing on the right-hand side always has to be a value or something that results into a value. Now, here we're using new scanner. We're gonna learn more about the new keyword when we get into object-oriented programming. Just to understand, in order to use a scanner, we have to build a particular instance of it. We can build instances of things in Java using new keyword. So we'll call it new, and then we'll call the scanner constructor to build us a scanner object that we can use in our application. And so the scanner object needs to know the thing it's gonna scan. So the thing it's gonna scan is the thing that goes in between the uh, parentheses. And so we wanna scan the input string. Scanner is a really powerful tool. There's more than just input streams that we can use a scanner on. We can use it to scan elements in a string, for instance, and parse a string into data as well. Because a string represents a sequence of characters, just like the input stream does. We can also use a scanner on a file if we wanted to, pass it a file descriptor, and then we can use the scanner to read the contents of a file. So scanners are kind of multi-useful in the fact that they can be used to read streams, they can be used to use string, uh, to read strings, or they can be used to read uh, files. In this course, we'll predominantly just use them to read our input stream and maybe strings in the lab. But understand, we have to tell it what it's scanning, and that's what we're doing now. And so by default, the way that we call our, so once we set up a scanner onto a data source, we can then call next on it. Now, by default, the next method, and notice we're calling that on the variable. So what happens is we're storing this variable that represents our scanner object, where a scanner object, it has a collection of methods we can, it has behaviors tethered to it. Let me show you the API here. So again, whenever we encounter anything new, all of our answers are in the documentation. So let me type in scanner, Java, what version of Java are you using? 17, probably. Okay, here, let's go to Oracle's website, scanner, class scanner. It is inside of the util uh, package, right? Java.util, so we can see right there. We can get sample code, we can get descriptions. The documentation on Java is very good. If I go here, this tells me all of the behaviors that I can find out from scanner. So you have like has next or uh, has next int or has next double or ha has next float. So this allows me to look at the state of my, where the scanner is at inside of the stream or whatever the source is and determine if that piece of data is the next thing that can be read from that. So that returns back a Boolean value, something that's either true or false, right? Alternatively, I also have next, where it's actually going to read the contents. It's going to grab the contents from the stream or the file or the string and parse it. It's going to return it, but then it's going to move to the next element. So when you do next, that's kind of a destructive action. By destructive, I mean it's taking something that's currently in the stream and removing it out the stream and providing it to your program. But once you do that, it's no longer in the stream any longer. And so there's a next method for each data type that we want to go ahead and contextualize 
from our stream. So we can read data in as tax or strings. We can read data in as ints. We can read data in as doubles. I mean, look at all my options here. These are all the options. We could do it as next line, next line. So by default, next uses as a delimiter, either a space, a tab, or a new line character. New line explicitly only uses new line characters as the delimiter. So it won't stop reading a piece of text when it hits a space or a tab. It'll continue reading from the input stream all the way until it hits the new line character. So, and sometimes be wary of this. You'll probably encounter this. You might get an error from this. So understand this now. If you do next int, it only grabs the number from it. It doesn't grab the new line character. So it can leave a dangling new line character in your int. So if you try to do, uh, if you try to read like a, 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 a integer and then try to read a string after that, you might not read the string you think you are because you might grab the new line character from the stream and it thinks that's the string you're looking for. So you'll probably encounter that. If you do understand that's a possible kind of edge case that sometimes happens. Oh, I'm already on myself here. Perfect. Okay, let's actually take a quick demo and uh, of this, of this, uh, and for me, I like to, I like to touch the board. Touch the slides, interact, I like to be interactive. Okay, so that import statement, this is probably the first time you had to do an import statement because for our output operations, which uses system, that's part of java.lang, we get that for free. String is a reference type. That actually also exists in java.lang, but we don't have to manually import that. That's given to us for free in every Java application. But the moment we want to use scanner, we have to import it to the very first line of our code. Even before we define our class is where our import statements go. So keep that in mind. You do not import inside of the class definition. It has to happen before you start your class definition. So here I will import, and then I got to give the path, the class path, of where that scanner class exists at. And if you need to find where that's at, check the API. The API should be your source truth for all things Java. Get used to that now because that will benefit you as you progress as a developer moving forward. Java.util.scanner. And so highlight yellow is the part of the code that we really care about for this particular operation. Then we have uh, our class definition. Remember that our class has to be named with a capital letter, uppercase letter. And then we use the curly braces to define scope. I'm indenting, so this is easy to read, right? Then I have my main method. Remember, all of our statements have to go in methods. All methods have to go into classes. All of our classes have to go into packages. That's the way Java keeps all of the source code organized. Here, I'm going to create that scanner. When I create my scanner, it's easy just to initialize it as opposed to declare and assign. So I'm going to create a scanner, and I'm going to scan on system.in the input stream. So again, the input stream by itself doesn't have any built-in methods, but scanner has plenty. And so we'll use a scanner to parse and read the input stream for us so that we don't have to understand the logic of encoding things from bytes into data. Handle for us. Okay, so for example, suppose I wanted to grab a line of text all the way up to the new line character. So I want to be able to get, so for instance, a name, a name might be a first name and a last name, right? So you might have a space in between. So this might be an instance of where I want to do next line. So next line could have Ted space homework. And then I can store that into a variable. And then I could print that with a formatted string. So these are all statements. The ones that aren't highlighted yellow are the operations we've already seen. Here, enter a year. Well, I can use my input. I can use my scanner object to scan for an integer. So it'll look into our input stream and it'll try to read the next piece of data as an integer data type, which means I can then store it as an integer data type inside of our application. And then we can print that out. And if we're gonna print that up, I gotta use D, right? For a decimal integer. And then if I want a double value, because, hey, I wanna enter some dollar amount here, I can then ask my scanner object, hey, give me the next double from the input stream. 
And then I can store that. It's going to return it back to me. So it now exists inside of my application. And so I want to store it so I can access it later on this line here. So this is a good example of an application that's using three of the five foundational operations that require us to build out our algorithms, right? Output operations, input operations, storage operations, and output operations. So we're doing outs, we're doing ins, and we're doing stores. And you'll see how they all combine together to start to build something that looks more like a real application. We're not quite yet there yet, though. We need to start talking about uh, processing operations to really start making interesting things. Oh. So I only have a few minutes left. So what I'll do is I'll motivate the concept of processing operations. So we did the easy stuff first. We talked about how to store things so that we can use it later. We learned how we can import things, how we can get data into our application so that we can use it in some kind of way. Or we talked about how to send things out because after we're done processing it, it's probably not useful just to exist in the application. Probably the user wants to see it and we gotta use it for something else, right? Like if there's no output, we're doing all this processing and no one gets to see. So that would be a waste of time. So clearly there's output operations. But the crux of what these three other operations allow us to do is to get it into the system so we can start processing it into a meaningful way. So like, I love going back to the rest of the example. The rest of the example, what were our processing operations? It's the things that mutate the state of our data from one set of values or one set of type into another set of values or another set of types. So in cooking, our processing operations could be things like dicing, cutting, or, 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 or things like that, right? You're actually mutating your ingredients. Or when you cook something, you're changing the state of your ingredients from one thing to another, right? So there's this concept of processing on top of the ingredients in cooking that fundamentally by processing them, translates it from your initial sets of ingredients of like flour and eggs and sugar and milk to allow you to produce something like a cake. And so what our processing operations that we have as defined by our data models, so things that are numbers, things that are text, things that are Boolean data, we can use some foundational processing operations, probably things you already know, to convert those, to translate those into new results that we can then model as a new state of something, as the solution for what our application solves to be the answer that you're looking to deliver. So that we'll talk more about these processing operations, what they are definitively more, more uh, academically and how we use them in Java next class, which I guess is on Tuesday. Excellent. Thank you for uh, coming to class today. Thank you for uh, watching the lecture. I'll try to get these uh, lectures up today or tomorrow when they're done processing. And oh, yeah, sure. Do we have any?